Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Twitter space today. I'm Zandra, the community manager for Charmverse. And for any of our new listeners, Charmverse is a Web3 community platform for managing members, coordinating tasks, facilitating decisions, and holding each other accountable. Members sign in with crypto wallets and gain access via community tokens and NFTs. And it brings together onboarding, payment management, proposals, project trackers, and data repositories in one place. So definitely check out Charmverse after this space. And I'm really excited to have our guest here. Um, they were here in November talking impact DAOs, and we wanted to bring Deepa back to further investigate what impact DAOs are all about. So Deepa, welcome. Thank you, Zandra, for having me again. I'm so excited to share about my favorite topic. <laughs> Well, you are our resident expert, so I couldn't imagine a better person to have here today. And um, I think impact DAOs are really important to be talking about, and we're going to be talking about why they're inevitable. So I think it's going to be a really important topic to inform people about. So I think we should just kind of go back to basics to kick this off and just break down what is a DAO for any listeners that might be new to Web3. So we know a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization, but do you want to dive in a bit more to what a DAO actually means? Yeah, they are uh, primarily internet native organizations um, and they're DAOs of different types. Uh, yes, DAO stands for decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, decentralized stands for distributed power, decentralized power, also distributed team because they, they are essentially gathering on the internet. Uh, autonomous means um, certain parts of the DAO are automated. For instance, uh, sometimes, uh, most of the times, it's the fund transfer that's automated. Uh, fund allocation is automated. Um, also, um, autonomous in terms of uh, the the entity is autonomous. It's sovereign. It's independent. It's on the blockchain. Nobody can shut it down. Um, uh, similarly, uh, autonomous individuals like the con DAO contributors are very sovereign people. They aren't tied to a DAO with any contract. They uh, the right to entry and right to exit is pretty. Uh, easy. They can enter a DAO anytime they want. They can leave a DAO anytime they want. They're mostly, you know, task-based uh, work contracts. Not even a contract, basically. Uh, they're very task-based. And then organization, as everybody understands, is a, a group of people that comes comes together around a common purpose, a sh shared vision. So that's what uh, the DAO of a DAO is. And there are different types of DAOs. Um, um, uh, you know, based on what your mission is. The first examples of the DAO, I think the very first DAO was, uh, I, I think it was 2016, which was set up as a venture fund, you know, to allocate resources, uh, to invest in startups. And uh, so the first kind of DAOs were more collective, uh, like, you know, you collectively pool in money and you allocate those funds. So it was all around... Uh, pooling of funds and allocation of funds and everything was pretty autonomous about it. People, strangers gathered in a very trustless environment. You know, they didn't know, need to know each other. They didn't need to form relationships. All they needed to do was pool in money in a multi-sig, which b uh, builds trust because, you know, uh, in a multi-sig, which is a joint bank account on the blockchain, uh, in order to release funds, uh, multiple people have to sign. And so that kind of builds trust among strangers. So that was the first use cases of the DAO that we saw. And then there are these big DeFi DAOs, which are around DeFi protocols. And there are NFT DAOs, which are around NFT communities. And the space that I really dig into is impact DAOs, which are uh, around organizations that are making this world a better place. You know, they have doing good is core to their mission and that's why they exist so i see coconut dao here <laughs> and maybe we should zandra uh, bring coconut dao up as well to just to sample a little bit of what impact DAOs do because uh, coconut dao is uh, is amazing they're based in uh, a dominican republic but they have a global community that's uh, you know coming together to save coconut plantations in Dominican Republic. So there are multiple use cases of impact DAOs and that's just one of it. 
Absolutely. I actually just sent Wasabi from Coconut Network um, an invite to speak because I, I agree. I actually just had a meeting with him last week um, because he is a Charmverse user and I wanted to get some feedback on some of that. So um, yeah, so the Impact DAO, why I think it's so important, and again, we're going to dig in a little deeper, and Wasabi, I definitely want to hear some of your take on this too, is it's enabling people to work as a community around a common goal to do good for the world, right? And we need more of that. And that could be anything from contributing to saving the planet to improving people's lives. Um, so that's pretty amazing. So actually, Wasabi, before we dig into the uh, Dow Deep is a part of. Why don't you tell us a bit about Coconut Network because it's a really great mission behind this as well. Hey Sandra, hey Deepa, uh, thank you for Hi, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, like Impact Dow, I, I didn't knew that I, I was going to build uh, an impact an Impact Dow. Like at first, at the beginning, that we were aiming to solve a simple problem that was raise money for uh, coconut plantation, but as we were digging in into the Web3 space, into the uh, local problems that we were facing uh, in order to raise the money, uh, I found out that we share uh, common problems, Web3 communities and the real-life communities. Of, of course, um, are not the same. Uh, I, at, at some context, they are the same, but it's not the same, like, exact same, uh, same problems, but... Um, I, I, I saw that some pieces were missing. For example, you can find in the Web3 space so many people that they have uh, really good in intentions and they, they want to do good, but sometimes they lack in funding or they lack of coordination. And that's where the impact uh, is created. Like when you coordinate the uh, fund, funding, um, you coordinate these people that wants to do good and impact the community in a really good way that that can that can sustain in, in, in the time that that that's that's impact for me. Um, I believe that impact DAOs are, are the future because we are connecting real problems to the Web three. Um, there, there is no VR market about uh, around that. So that, that that's how I see it. And why don't you just tell the listeners a bit about Coconut Network and what you're doing there? Because so there are different types of impact DAOs as well, right? So you're an agricultural DAO, essentially, which falls under an impact DAO category, right? Um, yeah, um, we are building a, a blockchain co-op that, that is based in, on, around coconut plantations. So basically what we're doing is connecting the landowners to the Web3 communities and um, creating a, a perpetual asset based on, on coconut plantations. Um, this this direct in, directly impact the community because we're creating many, many jobs with the, with the coconut plantation, but um, the landowners get to work in, in the farm. So they get to be a partner and, and to be a workers uh, earning a, a weekly uh, pay. Uh, a weekly pay. So basically, um, we are creating a perpetual asset and giving this asset back to the community through the coconut DAO. One hundred percent of the of the value created by the coconut plantation is being is going to be disbursed through the DAO back to the community one way or, or another. Fantastic! I love this project. Um, you're creating jobs. But you're also growing a product that is used in so many, in so many ways across the entire world. So, um, yeah, anyone who's not familiar with Coconut Network, definitely go check them out. You can just click on the PFP for Coconut Network right here. Give them a follow. They are doing really cool things over there that we definitely support. And as I mentioned, Wasabi is a user of Charmverse as well. So we are definitely in touch to get feedback from him about what. Uh, what they're looking for us to build and how they're using the platform. So thank you so much, Wasabi. I'm glad that you were able to come up and speak with us today. You're always a pleasure. Um, so Deepa, on that, let's talk Impact Down Media a bit, just so people understand the mission behind that. Day. Yeah, definitely. So 
uh when i got into the dow rabbit hole and i saw that as a model for uh, future nonprofits and organizing for causes i really wanted to go, uh, research them and understand the code of organization on the internet and so in order to do that i was like let's start a dow ourselves you know rather than me doing it solo let's live a dow life let's experience what it is to be a dow what it is to work with strangers on the internet if i'm going to be advocating for this i sh- might as well live this life myself and so i launched impact our media with a call for contributors um in june 2022 uh with uh, my proposal which was to basically research mature experienced impact dows and to study everything about them from inside out in terms of you know how they see the community how they uh, organize themselves how they get work done uh you know what are the tools they're using so it was like a very intensive study that we undertook but uh, we formed a dow to undertake that study um and we call ourselves uh, both researchers and storytellers so storytelling is very very important um and so all the 12 impact dows that were part of our study and the 30 builders that we interviewed so we interviewed multiple people for dow we have been telling the stories in a really engaging format um through podcasts through clips uh, through quotes you know just getting the word out about the great stuff they're doing and so many of them uh with that process have ended up connecting with each other like they were working in the space but they didn't know that they existed and that they work actually complements each other's work for instance uh human dow and good dollar dow which are both working in emerging countries start talking to each other because they were they felt united they were part of the study so they felt united and they were like wow you know we've learned so much about you and so it facilitated collaboration and uh, they they you know they're building on top of each other's strengths uh, in those c- countries and are making a more collective outreach efforts so it's been great um uh, as an impact our media like we've learned a lot ourselves uh, how to operate as a dao we've had our own learnings our own failures and uh, now we're moving into season 2 and uh, we're moving in with a lot of experience and learnings and a lot of improvements um the collaboration aspect where these these projects that you interviewed and worked with for the book are now collaborating is amazing and very web3 so that's fantastic um for anyone interested the it's called Um Impact Dow book the guide to everything Impact Dow a book written by a Dow for those who want to build their own Dows and this is currently a living document that resides online so anyone has access to it it's free you can go and you should go and read it i read it a few weeks ago and um yeah it's just super informative and you learn about really cool projects um that they researched for this book so i really look forward to the second one coming out Um also you noted the podcast which I was going to give you a shout out um all about impact dows. So if you're interested in impact dows, go check out that podcast. You can find it um through their website impactdows with an s.xyz. It's also on Spotify. So yeah. definitely go check it out. It's also on great app- Apple and the podcast is really interesting because these are real authentic interviews that we did as part of our research. So when we were uh, so our research methodology was to interview these builders one on one through one on one conversations. So we didn't do the cold survey format where you know you send out a survey uh and um you know you capture the data but you don't capture the nuances you know and that was very important for us like why did they want to go down the dow way why how did they you know what kind of deci- the decisions that they made why they made those decisions now those kind of things you cannot capture in a survey so we really wanted to get their story out what got them into web3 why are they so passionate and so these are really great interviews and some of them are brutally um and like uh you know we break down everything and uh, and we we've, we've asked hard questions too like we've learned about so much like uh, the kind of governance systems they embrace and uh, and then i ha- had doubts about delegate voting and i asked like uh, the gitcoin co-founder on the podcast like uh, i don't think this delegate voting the way you're doing it is right you know like because i'm just very curious and uh, i had this beginner's mind and i was like learning about all of this and i'm like 
I don't think it, you know, like uh, how they select their uh, their stewards, you know, because uh, in delegate voting, you got to allocate your votes uh, and uh, and the stewards are the elected officials who basically then vote on your behalf. And I was like, what's the process for electing these stewards and how long do they stay in power? Because if we do not uh, reelect them often, then the, the power concentrates in their hands. And so... Um, Basically, our, the whole Q&A that we did, which now uh, is available as a podcast, opened a lot of great conversation around DAO governance as such. And a lot of them are rethinking the DAO governance models. So it, uh, those podcasts are great. I would rec- highly recommend to go listen to the founder stories, the builder contributor stories, what excites them, what brings them, what kind of mindset is needed to be in a DAO because it's a different mindset. You know, you need to be more entrepreneurial. And so the contributors talk about it. So it's a very uh, real stories, you know, of people being in the space and building it. Absolutely. I second that. Definitely give it a listen. It is becoming one of those podcasts I listen to on the regular now. So definitely check it out. And I think that's really important that you ask those tough questions of these founders because, you know, DAOs, people are still skeptics. And I think it's important to say, hey, we know that there's pain points and weaknesses here and all DAOs are going to operate differently. But let's ask the questions and figure out how we can do it better and lend our expertise to try to make it a better process. Um, DAOs are still pretty new. So I think it is really important to have those tougher, very real conversations. That's right. It's an iterative process. What we're doing right now, everybody who's in the DAO space is uh, running a grand experiment for the future of work and the future of organizing, which is going to be on the internet. And so as uh, I just wanted to let, you know, everybody know uh, that as Impact Our Media, we don't judge. We don't say you're doing something wrong. <laughs> we just ask questions. And sometimes just asking questions brings clarity. And uh, and we are here to learn, you know, uh, because it's because if we, if, and there is no book written, you know, there are books written about traditional organizations. There is no book written about DAOs. And even a book is not a prescriptive book. It is only... It only gives you a window into how the DAOs are dowing, you know, and what are the 12 great case studies that exist. Um, and we'll be adding more case studies as we go along. By end of 2023, we want to have 30 case studies in there of experienced uh, impact DAOs. So uh, it's a great uh, learning experiment that's taking place. And a, a few best practices will come out from it, which will become the code for the future of organizing. You know, so that's what really excites us at this point of time. Yeah, I love that. Um, so as we were kind of talking leading up to this space and cla- and about how we can collaborate, um, you had suggested we talk about the topic of today, why impact DAOs are inevitable. So I know we'll weave through different topics and it'll kind of all come together. But if you needed to give like a small pitch on why you think impact DAOs are inevitable, what would that be? It'll be because it's just easier to meet people on the internet than to meet them in real life. Uh, you know, we are living more and more of our lives on the internet. The moment we wake up, we wake up with our phone in our hand and we're checking what's happening, right? So our lives are so governed by the internet. Also, you're able to uh, tap into expertise from all over the world. You don't have to just limit yourself to local expertise. So, uh, you know, uh, organizing for causes, solving big humanitarian problems requires uh, pooling of minds and it's just easier to pool that uh, collective expertise on the internet it just is a far more efficient and uh, the more natural way to do it than to do it otherwise. Absolutely. I mean, depending on someone's mission, right? You could be one of a hundred people that are interested in a certain topic and through the power of the internet, you can find those like-minded people who care about that same thing and set up your DAO and collaborate, which is pretty amazing. Um, So, Like I said, there's still some skeptics. DAOs aren't quite mainstream, I would say. But when I think about DAOs, I often think about nonprofits and believe that those will start to transition to become DAOs. Many have already started. And the ones that haven't started, 
you know, the ones that are pretty uh, been in the space for a long time, like which are institutions will probably never transform because it requires open mindedness. It requires being uncomfortable. It requires embracing change. But I feel like a lot of newcomers, you know, the social entrepreneurs, the change makers and the ones that are more, you know, more knowledgeable about the changing uh, environment will start as an as an impact out first. It's just easier to start as an impact out first. You know, you don't have to set up. You don't have to go through the process of setting up a massive infrastructure. You don't have to go through. You know, it's just easy to start running with your mission. You know, whatever your mission is, you can just get started now in five minutes, literally. It's that easy. Uh, and you don't have to wait to get some kind of certification and all that. That can be worked backwards. But you can get started with your mission. You can start um, collaborating. You can start uh you know, uh, generating interest around your mission, uh, find like-mindedness, bring the community together because it's community first, it's not infrastructure first, it's community first. Infrastructure can be sorted out subsequently, you know, infrastructure, I meant legal or whatever it is, that can be sorted out. And there are there are innovations happening in that space as well that is making it much faster to set up, uh, you know, uh, legal infrastructure too uh, with the help of endowment and LexDAO. So, Things are happening, and so all the, the the young ones would form an impact down instead of a nonprofit. A lot of nonprofits were still pretty agile and are pretty like uh, uh, futuristic and are very comfortable with technology. Are transitioning into becoming a DAO. I know a twenty year old nonprofit from Singapore who just reached out to me. Um, uh, I happen to live in that country, and uh, it's a it's a Singapore based nonprofit that's globally known. And they want to transition into a DAO because the founder has this growth mindset and he's like wondering what the future lies. Like it's a global sanitation movement, but it's fragmented, you know, Uh, people like uh, aren't talking to each other. But if they transition into becoming a DAO and say we bring them all into a common place on the Internet, they at least can start having conversations. And from there, you can then, you know, start organizing in different activities or you know whatever the different initiatives one would want to take so uh it's happening it's uh it's slow right now as i said but one day and soon enough it'll become a norm you know to be an impact out than to be a nonprofit. yeah i totally agree and i think this is a great opportunity to talk about kind of how impact DAOs differ from nonprofits. and one of the first things that come to mind is transparency Um, and I feel like a lot of NGOs could struggle with that. Um, but they're also, like you already said, they're fast paced, right? You can kind of include the community in the decision-making process. And, you know, that's not always the case with nonprofits. That's right. Nonprofits, uh, I've been, uh, you know, I've been a social entrepreneur my entire career. I've studied social entrepreneurship. I've studied social development. I started as a, you know, I started the first United Way chapter, uh, in India, uh, so um, so I started uh, my career in being a, no- a nonprofit professional, and soon I got frustrated with it because I just saw how many levels of intermediaries there were. Like uh, you know, sometimes when the funds got uh, donated uh, by say uh, a big philanthropist in America, then you know the the route to get to for a cause in India, then it went through multiple channels. And every channel took like a 15% cut, you know. Uh, so it, it, say, for instance, went to United Way America, then it would probably go to United Way International, go to a regional, then it'll go to the country level. And so I just got frustrated, you know, uh, with the system myself. And I'm like, wow, this is not efficient. So much goes through these intermediaries and it gets absorbed right there. By the time the money reaches the ground, very little is left. And yesterday I just helped... Uh, these folks from the UN who were leading the United Nations Environment Program in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, you know, a, a bunch of them are frustrated with the UN's uh, system, you know, which is highly bureaucratic. And uh, he discussed with me on a one-on-one basis in terms of why he wants to start a DAO, because I was like, what is it you want to achieve and why do you want to start? And he's like, 90% of the funds, more than 90% of the funds uh, allocated for projects on the ground at the grassroots level goes to consultancies, what he meant, which means to the consultants. And so very little fund actually reaches the community, the indigenous communities and all that it was earmarked for. So 
there are so many inefficiencies in the system. The systems are, these institutions are so big and so bureaucratic. Uh, and that, in fact, that just uh, brings so much of uh, transparency. It cuts down the fundraising uh, cost, uh, it, uh, fund allocation cost, it's just far more efficient. It's far, it gets rid of intermediaries, you know? You can directly start talking to the people you're serving. Absolutely. And Wasabi, you were saying something very similar when we spoke last week, um, as far as where the money goes from the contributors, you know, someone buys um, a share of coconut network, and that money goes directly to planting a coconut tree. Um, And I think caring for it for the first year of its life. Uh, After that, it's pretty sustainable. Um, Wasabi, is that right? Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, the money that we raising through the DAO shares is going to be strictly used to take care of, of the trees from seed to tree. Uh, $20 is the budget that we forecast that we need through a four year process. That is that the coconut trees needs to, to fully develop and start very fruits for the next 20 years. So, it's a four-year waiting time and then 20-year uh, harvesting uh, coconuts from the tree. Amazing. You know, like $20, you buy into something and you're you're creating or you're buying something that then is taken care of for four years. Um, it's pretty incredible what impact, impact DAOs can do. So if we have listeners that are currently listening and thinking, wow, I work for a nonprofit or I'm running a nonprofit, this sounds like something I want to do and convert to a DAO. I mean, what does that transition process look like? What what should they know, I guess? Anything it's, from it's, budgeting no. to you touched on law and regulation? Uh, it's, a, it's a gradual process. Uh, they say decentralization is a journey. And uh, what I've also studied from the research of the 12 impact DAOs so far is that extreme decentralization is also not an answer. Uh, uh, The sweet spot is somewhere in the middle uh, of the spectrum from centralization to decentralization, but it's definitely a journey. Uh, And uh, so as part of a study, we had uh, three organizations that transitioned into becoming a DAO. One is Gitcoin itself. Gitcoin was founded as a tech company in 2017. And in May 2021, they transitioned into becoming a DAO. And a lot of people in Web3 are familiar with Gitcoin. It's one of the largest uh, crowdfunding platform. Uh, uh, Wasabi and me currently are fundraising on Gitcoin. They apply quadratic funding where, you know, it, it's, it doesn't matter how much money you donate. It's the com- how, how many people support your project that matters. And uh, based on the number of people supporting your project, you can, uh, you can uh, get more quadratic funding matching pool. So for instance, I can give you a very concrete example. When we launched as Impact Our Media in June last year, we participated in the first Gitcoin fundraiser and only 140 people gave us money. I mean, 140 people gave us money, which was incredible because that's the size of the community that believed in our mission. Uh, but they collectively, they only gave us $700. But as part of uh, the Gitcoin qu- quadratic funding match, we got $8,000, you know? So that was the, that's the power of quadratic funding because uh, 140 people made that possible with their $1 donation. So it doesn't matter. The size of the donation doesn't matter. It's the size of the community that's voting, that's uh, signaling that this project is worth supporting. And that's how they calculate the quadratic funding match. So um, Gitcoin transitioned uh, from a tech company to being a DAO in uh, 2021. And uh, it was a slow process. And now uh, all the departments are, uh, including software development, is uh, is a part of the DAO now. You know, they, they did it slowly. They did it in phases. They didn't take the whole company and the whole departments uh, at one go and said, hey, now you're a DAO, you know. It was a slow process. They took one or two of them first um, and they started with that and now they've completely 100% transitioned into being a DAO. Similarly, uh, we have PacDAO. PacDAO is based in New York City. It started as a nonprofit in 2020 when COVID was really bad in New York City and people were looking for ways to donate money, you know, so it's really hyper-local mutual aid and they formed a 501c3 Um but in 2021, the whole nonprofit transitioned into being a DAO. They even got their bylaws amended to uh, 
uh, to uh, show their commitment towards being decentralized distributed power so in uh, in a nonprofit world uh, the power actually lies with the board of directors they are the ones who make the final decision um, but they uh, because pack dao had committed to being a dao they wanted to reflect the change in their law as well as well so they got their bylaws amended to say that uh, you know their community the active community who's participating in uh, you know their daily operations which uh, the active contributors have an equal say with the with the board of directors you know it's uh, not the board of directors who are the final decision makers so they uh, i think they're the first non profit to get that amended in the bylaws um and there's another one called dream dao which is part of uh, civics unplugged which is a uh, US based nonprofit 501c3 they train zen zs um they provide them scholarships uh they um provide them mentorship and they connect them with uh, you know uh, people uh, of great experience uh, and uh, they also help them uh, with placement so basically it's a very uh, just empowering these uh, bright kids uh high school kids you know and uh, so that's their mission but uh, they they realize as a non-profit they realize web3 is the is the future and that these young people will be going directly into web3 and so it's very important that we give them that exposure and so they started dream dao which is within the non-profit civics unplugged and dream dao has they run a parallel program where they select these uh, zen zs uh, from all around the world and they provide one on one mentorship with uh, people from the web3 experts from the web3 and uh, they also help them uh, you know uh, get to conferences there are so many web3 conferences that take place but they uh, they raise funds uh, and they sponsor their trips to say eat pagoda they uh, you know i met a lot of dream dao uh, kids in uh, eat at eat pagoda which was amazing they're just young kids you know uh, first year of college and they're getting exposed to like the future uh technology you know uh, it was just amazing and they also get placed with uh, web3 organizations where they can get hands on experience so we had two dream dao fellows uh it wasn't a formal placement with us it was just because they were so keenly interested in the topic that they they were part of impact dao media as well they weren't formally placed by dream dao but they just wanted to help with the research so we had two dream dao zenzis part of our our dao as well Uh, so th- these are few case studies a big one i would say you know the big one would be kimbel musk uh, he is the brother of elon musk and uh, he's really committed to the cause of agriculture and community gardens and uh, in 2020 i think it was 2012 yeah in 2012 he started big green nonprofit and uh, in 2021 he started a dao to decentralize grant making he wanted to experiment with decentralized grant making and see how effective and efficient it is and all he has to say now is it is the best thing possible you know just decentralizing grant making it has saved them so much money like uh, initially they used to uh, they spend was almost 45% but now it doesn't even touch 5% secondly uh, they are now engaging grassroots people in decision making you know where the money should go before it was the executive team sitting in offices having very little ground expertise making those decisions but now because they have frontline workers engaged in the process and they have a vote it's distributed far more efficient and far more directed towards addressing the problem than somebody in in the office making that decision you know it's more bottom up approach rather than top down amazing yeah i mean that's part of the power of a dao is giving voice to the community rather than the few executives that are whether it's just sitting in an office or just looking at you know how to make money um so really putting the money in the right places and listening to the right people who actually know what to do and who want to do the good. So what about scaling a DAO versus a nonprofit? I ha- I don't know the answer to this, but for some reason I feel like it would be easier to scale a DAO rather definitely, than a nonprofit. Definitely, definitely because you're opening yourself up uh, to the entire internet, <laughs> you know, like there are no borders. And so anybody who's interested in a cause as long as you've done a great job in terms of uh, getting your word out uh in terms of, you know, 
being able to let your community know that you exist as a DAO, as a as a community of passionate people who've gathered to address a cause, then the influx can be mind boggling sometimes. And onboarding is a massive a uh, problem in the dao space right now because newcomers show up in your discord and you need to start engaging them and the fact that they've showed up means they are there they're there for a reason they're 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 passionate about a cause and so it's very important that you engage with them and you find out what brings them there and how do you then get them involved in the work that you're doing so basically in in an impact uh, everything is built in public there is there are and that's another thing that it brings transparency you know because sometimes in the non-profit space you don't really know why certain things are done in a certain way or what the inside the inside of a non-profit looks like but here discord is your office you know and you're building everything in public people show up in most of the conversations are happening in public most of the decision making is happening in public and so people can be in your discord and they can be there and absorb the culture and they can absorb uh, the vibe and um, even if they are not ready on day 1 maybe day 10th or uh, 30 days later they'll just raise their hand and say hey i'd love to help out with this you know so that's what i've seen in my dao as well and that's how it happens in other daos too Yeah, the onboarding I think is really important to mention because like you said, you want to create this welcoming community, right, for those newcomers that that want to help and want to contribute. Um so I think that's important to say, you know, you want to make sure they know where to find the information about the DAO or what kind of tasks need to be done. Um and that's plug for Charmverse here. That's what we're trying to build at Charmverse and I think it's important to note that Um we've decided that Charmverse will be free for impact projects because we want to encourage them to continue doing good, you know, for the world. And and we just want to empower these communities. And because a big part of that is the transparency, right? If you are an impact DAO, in theory, you should be you should be doing this in public. It should be open source. People should be able to see where the money's going and how how it's being used and who's making decisions and the voting and all of that stuff. So, um Deep, I know we've talked a bit about Charmverse in the past, but again, I would love to do a demo because I think it could be a really good platform for the DAOs that you're working with um and interviewing. And that is something that we definitely care about. So, um Again, like you said, I think it's important to ask some of the tough questions. What are some of the pain points you're currently seeing as far as a DAO versus a nonprofit specifically and like something you would definitely want to change. Yeah, it's around coordination, I would say, because uh what happens uh when you are working with people on the internet is that it takes uh firstly as I talked about the influx, you know, you can have the sudden influx of people who are interested in helping you with your mission. And so you need to figure out effective coordination mechanism like how to effectively engage them in ways that uh uh they're able to contribute effectively. uh you know so how do you structure as a team you know what is the best way and uh, through my own learnings of r- running impact our media i actually you know we've been as a dao for 6 months uh and as a dao we've un- we've done a lot as a dao like we've fundraised uh, on gitcoin uh, twice uh, this is the third time we're fundraising uh we've researched 12 daos we've interviewed 30 builders more than 30 by now and uh, we've written a book as a dao we the first dao to write a book so uh, 22 people from across the world collaborated in diff- uh, and uh, in uh, real- in terms of people who stayed from the start to the end uh, i would say there were only three people but uh, contributors came in uh, and contributed to different parts of the project and uh, and because i was the only full time person uh for this project uh i became a central point of coordination and i went through this coordination nightmare i would say that because uh, uh sometimes i felt that i'm just coordinating uh people and i'm not really doing the real work and so this time i want to make a decentralized work decentralized coordination as much as possible and so i've been really thinking hard how to do that like what is the best way to do it and the, what i've come upon is that the pod level you know uh, 
you know, figuring out what your tasks are going to be, what your key activities are going to be as an organization, and then setting up pods that are not more than five people. Because uh, I feel like uh, on the internet, uh, five is a good number, like a small enough number for those five people to coordinate with each other and get work done. Um, and, uh, in, you know, when you're in physical offices, it's a different scenario. You can just go over to somebody's desk and immediately get something sorted out and you're having more face-to-face conversations, but this is internet, you know, you're collaborating online and, um, and different time zones and distributed teams. And so how can you be effective? And as a high performing DAO, like, uh, and if you want to be a high performing DAO, like you want to get work done, then what is that, if that good way to structure yourself organizationally you know and uh, what should be the size of the teams and so i've been thinking really hard and i've been going really deep with this and uh, and i looked at amazon you know amazon is a company and amazon uh, talks about decentralization <laughs> you know like they they use the word decentralization in their organization structure uh, at pod levels, they and this uh, they have this two pizza team concept, where uh, you know the work stream sh- should not be more than um, ten people basically. So ten people should be able to share two pizzas. You know that's the concept, and uh, it should not be more than ten. So that's for Amazon, and Amazon has offices and people meet. But we are completely internet based, and so what should be the right size for us? And I feel like. Five is a great number. At least we're going to be experimenting with five as a number um, in season two and setting up pods for different activities, uh, different core activities, and then having leaders, uh, you know, having a directly responsible individual for every pod. So uh, I'm not the one who's overseeing everything, but, you know, there are these, it's more decentralized. Would you, would these pods be considered sub uh, n- no. So sub does again, uh, I know, uh, I had asked this question because somebody was talking about sub does on Twitter and, uh, the sub does don't have a fixed team size. They can go from five to hundred to thousand. So it doesn't really solve the problem of, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, being effective, uh, in terms of getting work done. Right. And they do say that sub does solve for governance problems because then, as a sub DAO, uh, you can decide for themselves rather than you know having the entire community uh, decide. But then, because the the team size is not fixed, sub DAOs can end up having the same problems as DAOs. You know, but at pod level, when you do pod level decentralization, a lot of decisions can be made by five people rather than pulling in the entire community, say of thousand people, to make decisions. And sometimes those thousand people may not have expertise that your pod has, you know? So for instance, if it's a branding or a marketing pod, it's better that those five people who've shown interest because they have some level or some experience or some intrinsic motivation or are committed to figure out, even if they don't have prior experience, a part of that pod that they make those decisions rather than inviting thousand people to come and vote on the color of your logo, whether it should be red or white, you know, it just delays, it just adds more processes, you know, it just becomes more bureaucratic. So how do you stay efficient? How do you uh, stay efficient? And how do you stay decentralized? uh, At the same time is is a challenge. And that's something it's an interesting challenge, you know, because as I said, everything is an experiment right now. And, um, and maybe pods are not the solution, you know, we don't know, but at least we're experimenting with that going forward. Yeah, definitely. I So we're running short on time, and I feel like we could go on and talk about Impact DAOs forever. Um, I love the passion that you have behind these, and it gets me really excited, and I'm guessing it's doing the same for our listeners. But let's talk about how you think DAOs will change the future of work. This is definitely a topic I want to get into before I cut you loose. Um, What are your thoughts on that? You did touch on it a bit earlier, but... Yeah, I mean, the way uh, people communicate in DAOs, uh, for instance, we can already say emails are dead, right? <laughs> like nobody's sending emails to anybody these days or they're just for scheduling, you know, like you want to schedule a Google Meet, so you do a calendar invite. But most of the communication is taking place on Discord or Telegram or Twitter. <laughs> like Twitter DMs have become emails, literally. Uh, that's how I treat Twitter, you know, like I'm always uh, any uh, work-related stuff or if I want to connect with anybody who I've never connected, like it's called uh, it's cold emailing, but it's cold DMing, like literally, like 
uh, sending them, uh, you know, uh, just uh, asking them for help. So I feel like uh, emails will be totally uh, gone uh, in the future of work. I feel uh, uh, right now we only use it for scheduling. Uh, it will be, uh, uh, it's remote, you know, it's remote by design. It's, uh, there will be no offices. It'll be remote by design because we are internet native organizations. Uh, so that's the second um, uh, thing. And uh, people will be more flexible, like uh, with with their working hours. You know, there is no, uh, like the responsibility will lie with the individuals. And that's why it attracts a certain kind of indiv- individuals, like the ones who are entrepreneurial, who are self, uh, you know, who can self uh, instruct themselves to say, hey, I've got this timeline. I need to finish it by so and so time. There are no bosses. There's nobody telling you you've got to finish it, right? There are leaders. There are no bosses and DAOs. So uh, it'll, it'll provide for more flexible work timing, which is great. Like you don't have to be in the office at 9 a.m. You don't have to go through the rush hour. You don't have to drop your kids at like a certain time in a preschool uh, before the school starts because you've got to report at work at 9 a.m., right? You can be more flexible with, with when you want to start as long as you get the work done. You know, that's the idea. Get the work done. Get it done at your pace, you know, whatever works for you. Yeah, uh, going back to the email and Twitter thing, I just wanted to give another shout out to Wasabi at Coconut Network who connected me with Deepa. So, and we did that through Twitter. So, you know, there's an example of how (laughs) how we connected and coordinated. But how about, I? so I live in the U.S. and health insurance, right? Benefits are such a big thing that you want from your employer. So how does that play into it when people say, I want to be a part of these DAOs, but I don't have that health insurance? That's right. So right now the the DAO scene is so part-time. I like because it's a passion project for a lot of people like they have their full-time jobs and so uh, a lot of DAOs you'll see like uh, take it to be bankless media you know which is one of the largest uh, decentralized media organization everybody is uh, you know the bankless DAO, not the bankless HQ that's different they're, they're uh, you know there they're are two different operating structures right there but bankless DAO people they're all uh, con- part-time contributors they're all task-based contributors they're all bounty-based contributors so everybody's holding on to their real jobs at, at this point of time because uh, and they do these things um, as a side project as because they're passionate they uh, you know they want to connect with like-minded people so it'll be uh, you know e- either they'll be uh, working on the DAO passion project during work before work or after work but this is the beauty right now it's just attracting people who find the passion which they might not find uh in their day job right because uh, uh day jobs can get very monotonous at times uh even if it was your passion to begin with it, it's somehow is deprived of uh joy at times right but uh, DAOs bring that excitement back into you. So it's very part-time at this point of time. I know a lot has to evolve, like a lot will change. Uh, but right now, most of the DAO work is contributors-based, which are mostly part-time contributors. Unless there is an organization like Gitcoin, which, uh, you know, which is a DAO, which has full-time contributors, which basically means full-time employees, and they have provisions in place to support, th- support that. Okay. Wasabi, what do you have to say about that? You're raising your hand. Um, I just dropped a tweet about Opolis that is already wor- working on, on, to fix this problem uh, about uh, benefits for Web3 for web workers. Uh, I, I just dropped a tweet under the, the space uh, link for you to check it out. Thank you. Yeah, everyone, check that out. So it's in the chat. Oh, cool. That's great. So Opolis. Yeah, I think I met some people from there in Bogota, actually. So I will definitely look into that more. But that's uh, a great reference to have. So as we wind this space down, I guess I really just want to hear. I mean, you're already speaking with such passion. But if you needed to break it down into one little blip, what excites you most about Impact Dows, Deepa? It's the 
it's just cracking the code for the future of organizing right now. It's so exciting. As I said, the space is not perfect, but because I believe in it so much that, uh, and I know that, you know, internet is where we all live our lives these days. And it is just far more uh, easier to find like-mindedness on the internet than to find it in your own neighborhood at times. Uh, um, and uh, and it excites me. And I've already seen, I mean, it's not just because I believe in it, but I've also seen working examples of it. I've seen it with my own DAO, you know, like how 22 people from our, around the globe, uh, from different parts of the world, uh, somebody from Dharamshala, which is like, uh, you know, which is very close to the Himalayas, which is where the Dalai Lama lives. Uh, there was a contributor from there contributing in my DAO, and I don't know how he heard about it on the internet again. And uh, he reached out and he was part of the project. So I'm like, people people from remote parts of the world are connecting, you know, like, uh, it's amazing. So, uh, and so we have working examples of it. Uh, all the 12 case studies listed in our book is a working example. Coconut Dao is a working example. Like, he is being able to regenerate and preserve plantations in Dominican Republic by pooling in, uh, you know, uh, and uh, mobilizing people from all around the world on the internet. He doesn't have to make road trips or uh, fly to any of these countries to mobilize support. He can just do it on the internet. It's just so much more efficient and effective. And so that excites me. And I know there are many problems we are, uh, you know, right now, and it's all a grand experiment, but that's also exciting, right? Because we need to find out what would be the idea. Maybe we will never reach that stage, but what will be the most effective way of organizing on the internet, you know, um, based on different uh, team sizes and stuff like that. So all that is very exciting because what we're doing right now is we are basically defining the future. Everybody here who's in the DAO space is defining the future, you know, by running a grand experiment ourselves. I love all of that. And I also love that you're kind of bridging, you're working with all these different generations and kind of bridging the gap from, from, you know, people that have been around and kind of seen different iterations of organizations to the youngest people that are, you know, their first year of university. And, um, and you really are making a difference. And I look forward to the book that's coming up um, and learning more about these projects. It is such a pleasure speaking with you and learning more about Impact DAOs from you. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to join me again today. Thank you, Sandra. It's been amazing. And in terms of talking about just people from different age groups, uh, I just want to give you an example because it's so inspiring. Uh, there's something called an e-democracy DAO. And uh, I happened to meet this person he's 70 plus years old and uh he's part of e-democracy DAO, and he's a really renowned uh high profile person in canada active in politics uh once upon a time he wanted to be the mayor of toronto he's written many books he's fought uh he's even fought in a war in israel like the 12 day war that took place so he's the and he's interviewed the king of jordan and stuff and now he's part of uh, a DAO, like a, a demo, e-democracy DAO, because that really excites him. And I've been exchanging notes with him because I wanted to launch a magazine myself. And he launched the first culture magazine in Canada. And so I went to him with advice in terms of how should I do it? I want to, it has to be focused on impact DAOs. And he's like, make it all digital. Don't even go print. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be out of money. Like, in no, in like in uh, the first uh, publication itself but he he and me have regular conversations about governance and he's that excites him the democracy part of it ex excites him you know how these communities want to be democratic and be more decentralized in decision making and um, and so just to give you an example like he's 70 plus and he <laughs> and I, I speak to him and then I speak to these uh, 16 17 year old part of dream DAO you know so that's the level that we're talking about it's amazing. I love it. It really, the, the internet, Web3, it's connecting everyone and making this collaboration possible, um, attracting like-minded people that are passionate about a common goal that they can go after. It really is heartwarming and amazing. Um, listeners, if you are part of an impact community and you're trying to figure out how to collaborate, please check out Charmverse. Like I said, we love empowering Web3 impact communities and 
we really want to give them a platform to carry out everyday operations that could be drafting consistent and peer reviewed proposals or engaging your contributors using a bounties board so they know what tasks need to be done or even raising donations through NFT subscriptions. We're here for you and we want to help. I also encourage you to check out Impact Dow Media. Their website is impactdows.xyz. Click on Deepa's PFP and check out the Impact Dow book and definitely check out the podcast. And another shout out to Wasabi from Coconut Network, one of our speakers today. Please give them a follow. They're doing amazing things too. And Impact Dows are here to stay and they're going to change the world. So thank you, Deepa. Thank you, Wasabi. Again, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Chambers, for having us and for giving us the platform to talk about Impact Dows. And I'm so glad that you made that announcement today because I feel it's the start of a trend. I come from Salesforce Foundation. I've worked with them before. And Salesforce was the first company to commit uh, that their technology will always be free for nonprofits. And I've, I, I, when you said that, I was like, wow, this is like uh, a start of a trend in the Web3 space. So congratulations for uh, being a thought leader in that. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to collaborating with both you and Wasabi going forward. Um, and I'm sure we will be in touch very soon. Thank you. Well, have a fantastic rest of your day. Listeners, thanks for showing up today. I hope you learned a lot about Impact DAOs. And obviously, Deepa can uh, be a wealth of knowledge on all things Impact DAOs. So definitely go check out the book and give a follow. And have a fantastic rest of your week. And I'll see you next week with another Twitter space. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.